1976, I was a young sergeant, cavalry scout in the 21 Cav. Um, we were participating in a Brigade 76 rotation in Germany. My platoon leader walked up to me one afternoon and he said, Sergeant White, I need you to go sec to secure this bridge with your section and the rest of the platoon will pass through at 0600 hours in the morning. It was about 60 kilometers away and we did exactly that. Four, 40 years later, I'm now a Lieutenant General, Deputy Commanding General of the Army Material Command. I go on a sustainment terrain walk. We visit countries such as Germany, Estonia, Georgia, Slovenia, and I'm standing on a hilltop in Poland. And I'm standing on that hilltop reflecting on what my platoon leader asked me to do 40 years earlier and I'm saying to myself, Larry, would I approach this any differently? And the answer was, heck yes. I, it was a little stronger than that. So, 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 and so I started to think, and my mind was really churning. And the first thing I said, do I have the capabilities and the firepower to protect myself and my squad? Then I said, what if an engine light came on? Can I expect? that feed to go back to an SSA somewhere, and then in the next 48 hours, I see a drone flying over to deliver the part? Or do I have the capability to repair that or to fabricate that part in my vehicle? These are the things that was going through my mind 40 years later. And it's all about what we're going to talk about this afternoon, expanding that competitive space base to be able to fight, sustain the future battlefield of tomorrow. So I'm going to turn it over to my good buddy and friend, Bill Moore, who's going to introduce the panel. And then we, each one of the panel members is going to give you some context. And then we're going to get into some questions and answers. And I want you guys and gals to come out with us. Sound like a plan? Sure. All right, let's do it. All right, thank you, General Weiss, my prior boss and uh, mentor, and uh, and thanks to AUSA and LMI for uh, for hosting the event today. This has been great so far, and hopefully, we can at least meet expectations with our panel. Uh, what I'd first like to do is introduce the panel, and so we don't get accused of linear thinking. I'm not going to do this in a linear way, but uh, after I speak, we're going to start with General Rodney Fogg, who is the Commanding General of the Combined Arms Support Command. He'll kick things off for us by talking about the, uh, the update of how we plan to sustain the future fight from a doctrinal perspective, having recently published new doctrine. From there, we'll go to General, Lieutenant General Paul Ostrowski, who's the uh, Principal Military Deputy to the Assistant Secretary for, of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, the great Dr. Jetty, which we uh, just got to hear some some great comments from. But General Ostrowski will outline our efforts to reform the acquisition process, which is in need of reform, we all know, and then how the, the whole concept of the Army Futures Command fits into the equation as we try to achieve, uh, uh, get past the enemy of time in trying to get new capabilities out to the force quicker. From there, we'll go to Lieutenant General Retired Kathy Ganey, uh, former J4 on the Joint Staff and DCG of Transcom, uh, now with Cyprus International, but she will, uh, she'll walk us through the challenges of delivering sustainment on the future battlefield and the age-old problem of getting the right stuff at the right time to the right place in the, uh, through the lens of multi-domain operations. And then, and then finally, we'll finish up with, with Mr. Dave Bozeman. He, will, uh, he is the Vice President of Amazon Transportation Services and I hope you'll share a few secrets because we sure want to do it like they do it, I, I got to say. But uh, he'll discuss the high expectations for logistics in the commercial world and what his team is doing to meet those expectations and some of the ways they are addressing cybersecurity as well in, in their operations. So uh, as General Pegui mentioned this morning, you know, when you can order that item and, you, and if it takes longer than two days, you're, you're pretty upset with yourself and with whoever you're buying it from. 
uh, it's a different world when we're, we're kind of satisfied if we can get it to a unit in 30 to 60 days, frankly, in the logistics world. So we got, we got some room for improvement. So uh, uh, with that, I, I did want to talk a little bit about expanding the competitive space when it comes to sustaining the future. So what are we talking about there? The, uh, it really starts with our national defense strategy, with, which outlines the rise of near-peer competitors. And while we've been engaged in, in years of counterinsurgency operations, as you know, our near-peer adver adversaries have developed advanced capabilities driven by rapid, rapidly changing technologies as well as doctrinal evolution. Bottom line is the, uh, the, the game is changing, as my old boss used to say. We've got to stay ahead of the game, and we've got to be game changers with it. So with the, these, uh, these advancements, our playing field, where and how we will fight has changed dramatically, and our adversaries have expanded the layers and the domains by which they can attack us to include areas such as cyber and space. You know, in the past, we were either fully dominant in these domains or they weren't relevant based on our adversaries' capabilities. This will not be the case moving forward. Uh, long ago, British poet John Lilly in 1579 said, and you've probably heard this, all's fair in love and war. And, uh, and, and I couldn't believe it was actually that, that long ago when it was uh, first written. And, uh, and basically, when you think through, uh, if we just jump to the American Revolution, when we had a very well-equipped, well-trained army uh, that the British had, and we were able to beat them in the American Revolution through uh, game-changing tactics, guerrilla-type warfare that they weren't used to. They were almost appalled by us not following the rules of war back then. And that's kind of where we are today. The, the, the game is changing. Uh, you know, if I could just make a quick comparison. If the battlefield were the gridiron, this is how things might change. I'm a Packers fan. We have a new coach, Matt LaFleur. My good friend here is a, uh, is a Vikings fan. But imagine the Packers yes. being able to uh, alter the play call as it's fed down into the Vikings quarterback uh, right in the middle of the game. Would that be an unfair advantage? I think it would be, and uh, they might get in trouble for that. Or Sergeant Major Bell, who's a Redskins fan, being able to control the ball whenever General Pegues Cowboys throw it. Uh, <laughs> would that be an unfair advantage? Or my third example, someone from the New England, New England Patriots altering critical materiel for an advantage. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, they did that. <laughs> so, it's possible. They did get in trouble for it. Uh, the four-game suspension was upheld after a year or two. But anyway, all jokes aside, all of these would fundamentally change the game of football. And, the, and as you all know, the Patriots won that game. They crushed the Colts in that game, as a matter of fact. But, um, but the way the game is traditionally thought of and played and the same is really true of our future battlefield. So in line with the, uh, with the national defense strategy, Secretary Esper and, the, and General Milley has really focused our Army on, on the year 2028. And as the Army vision states, the Army of 2028 will be ready to deploy, fight, and win decisively against any adversary, anytime, and anywhere. And 2028 is our aim point, a few years beyond our five-year defense program, which gives us a little flexibility as we move forward. But we are on a fast pace to change things. I mean, just what we're trying to do with the FY20 budget, and, and Dr. Jetty, I think, fielded a couple questions. We have moved tremendous amounts of money to get after modernization the way General Milley and, and Secretary Esper see fit with the six priorities. And uh, so far, so good as that budget works its way through the committees on the Hill. So, uh, so, so, so some good, uh, so, so good progress there so far. So to achieve this end state, <clears throat> our entire Army must rethink the way we man, organize, train, equip, lead, and of course sustain. You heard General Pegui uh, mention this morning that logistics will be contested in every domain. There's just no getting around this. It really starts with what we've called now the strategic support area. Uh, if, you, if you've heard General Perna talk lately, he talks a lot about operationalizing the strategic support area. So. Uh, it is the place where friendly strategic and national forces generate combat power, sustain operations, and project power. Largely what we think of as CONUS, but it's really even broader than that. What we used to consider safe havens, uh, it includes everything from our industrial base and supply availability to our power projection platforms, 
munitions and where we make munitions and our information readiness as well. On the battlefield of the future, the enemy may attack the SSA in an attempt to disrupt and degrade our deployments and supply lines. Some of this will come in the form of traditional lethal weapons or could or could, or may occur through non-lethal methods in these new domains, such as cyber and electronic warfare. This is something we haven't traditionally thought about often, but it is almost certainly will be a competitive space that we're going to have to deal with moving forward. The expansion of the competitive space, though, is not limited to the strategic support area. The same disruptions can affect our operations wherever and whenever as we're deploying, once we're in the AOR, and even at the lowest ta uh, tactical echelons as well. So as we, as we take a harder look at how we need to be doing business in the year 2028, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. How will we operationalize the strategic support area appropriately and protect it? How will we protect our supply chain, especially when it comes to cybersecurity? How are we going to align our formations and capabilities to better enable our maneuver commanders? And I think you heard a lot of that from Dr. Jetty a little bit earlier. And then how will our processes evolve at the strategic level to enable us to adapt at the speed required? As, uh, as, General, as Dr. Jetty mentioned, time as, a, uh, as an element of combat power. These are all questions we are going to try to address and, uh, as we hear from our panelists. And from that, I'll hand it over to General Fogg to, uh, to talk about doctrine. Over. Thank, thank you, sir. And uh, so it's great to be here and to be part of uh, the presentation today and be on this panel. Uh, so I'll just uh, jump in. You know, we've already had a lot of great context today with the first panel and our guest speakers. Uh, but I'll just pull in kind of uh, something Major General Kurt Ryan indicated. You know, Sun Tzu said, know your enemy, know yourself. And so um, we need to assess where we're at against a national uh, defense strategy, our near-peer competitor fight that we're looking at, uh, the multi-domain battlefield that we're going to be fighting on, contested in cyber, air, and maritime um, uh, land, of course, with long-range uh, fires from the enemy, et cetera. Uh, over the last 17 years, of course, we've been optimized towards COIN. And so now fm 30 uh, the NDS has us looking at large-scale combat operations. When we were uh, putting effort into MRAPs, as an example, Russia and China were developing, you know, electronic warfare systems, uh, you know, nine of them to be uh, exact, uh, integrated long-range fires complexes, et cetera. And really, uh, uh, as has been noted already today, uh, there's area where we don't have overmatch capabilities. In fact, we might be behind in certain areas. And so we've got to think through that and, again, assess where we're at, know ourselves and know the enemy, organize for large-scale ground combat operations, uh, and being able to quickly transition uh, into combat. And so uh, our forces have to be trained, equipped, uh, and modernized, and we've talked about that at the right levels. Uh, to execute uh, what is required for large-scale ground combat operations and move away from really the brigade-centric uh, organization that we've been in the past. And so with that, it kind of gives you some context along with everything else that was discussed today about um, our efforts with sustainment operations doctrine. And so FM40 is a manual that we really uh, hadn't looked at in a while. It, it hadn't really set on the shelf. and so. Uh, that capstone document now will drive other doctrinal changes. Uh, it is definitely aligned with FM30 that was uh, published in October 2017 that gave us a direction uh, and really the direction on the operating concept uh, unified land operation towards this MDO started there because uh, the words that are in that document uh, you've heard a lot of that today, and that's the direction we're going. The document that General Ryan talked about uh, for MDO 1.5, and then this uh, in the summer, I think we're going to be at MDO 2.0 as a document that will help lead for the future. So in FM 4.0, doctrine driving other changes and pushing us forward uh, in, in alignment, uh, it is written uh, similar to 3.0, and so it starts with the Army's, you know, strategic roles for shape uh, and prevent. And so when we think about the competitive space, uh, we, we can definitely put it in the context of shape and prevent uh, because that expands our 
competitive space when in the shape operations we're setting the theater, whether it's the European theater, the Pacific theater, where have you, or the strategic support area, CONUS. Uh, so uh, we also set the theater there because we've got to be able to power project uh, from our strate uh, strategic support area. How do we have a calibrated force posture that was you know, mentioned previously where we have the form, uh, forward presence, where we have the right APS capabilities, and we're looking that, at that in detail, uh, so that we just don't have, we don't have to move the equipment, we just move the personnel, and we have capabilities for, uh, 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 to execute on that MDO battlefield. Forward supplies, munitions, uh, in the shape operations, it's described in this manual. Um, our host nation agreements and access, you know, the expeditionary early entry capabilities, so we have some gaps as we executed this analysis. And so even in our doctrine, we talk about providing commanders, you know, planning considerations against the places where we potentially uh, have some gaps. Uh, prevent, uh, link to deterrence. Again, expanding the competitive space, uh, the mobility and the deployment of our uh, combat credible forces uh, into a theater, the reception, staging, onward movement and integration, uh, is in there, uh, it talks about how we need to think through uh, fighting off the ramp and that having that capability. Again, not focused on the coin fight that we've been executing for 17 years, but large-scale ground combat operations. Um, so doctrine is uh, definitely important when you think about that, you know, ugly acronym, ac acronym of DOTMOPF. And so doctrine, organization, training, material solutions, leader development, policies, and facilities. And so how does our doctrine that I'm talking about drive us towards change? And so there's big ideas in 4.0 about how you assign a sustainment brigade to a division, assign an organic capability of the CSSB. These are organizations that will enable the division as a fighting formation, the core, has an assigned ESC, again, enabling it with sustainment capabilities and headquarters, a new mission command structure. And when you look at this uh, design for the division, you also have organic companies for maintenance, supply, and transportation that become lettered companies. They, again, gives you a capability that you didn't have before uh, so that cores and divisions, again, are enabled as fighting forces, the future. And so let me uh, talk about the future and where this drives us for an MDO ready force in 2028, an MDO capable force in 2035. Uh, we were, will work towards the doctrine that will drive us at the, after the uh, current gaps and then to the future force where we have multi-domain units, we have uh, modernization, we talked about the six or the eight CFTs and the 30 programs. Um, you have to be able to train that and organize organizations and structures to meet the material modernization. So that is kind of the area where our doctrine takes us, uh, the modernization takes us, and really following the line of DOTMO PF. Um, some of the things that we've done to modernize sustainment, so we've talked about, we understand CFTs and the things we have to get after there, uh, but um, we're uh, looking at a larger uh, bulk fuel tanker because of the gap that we have for, as it was discussed by General Pegui, uh, line haul distribution for fuel and tactical distribution for fuel. We're looking at leader follower uh, capabilities and linking that to PLS recap. Uh, we're looking at early entry hose line capabilities, uh, buying out the tank rack module for fuel, the water hippo, a trailer strategy that gets after replacing older 872 trailers, HETs, and providing us a medium uh, equipment trailer. And then, of course, our logistics information systems that have to be able to operate in a disrupted environment so it needs disconnected operations uh, abilities. And, and then we need to add things to it with our commodities so that we have that sustainment cop uh, that, you know, has been mentioned and referred to. Do we have a sustainment cop that we're right now with GCS Army gives us maintenance class nine, it gives us uh, uh, class seven, but we need to think adding ammo and medical to that. And then being able to use that data in a way that was discussed by Dr. Jetty. How do we modernize ourselves with our logistics information 
systems are sensors that could be on that tank that he talked about. Sensors could, could tell us how much fuel it has or doesn't have, how many rounds of ammunition it needs, and then we could have a better understanding of the battlefield with the sustainment common operating picture to be able to provide that predictive logistics and that precision logistics that was mentioned. And so with that, I probably talked too long, but thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. And uh, everybody, good afternoon. It's great to be here, not only because I get the opportunity to sit with this great forum and panel, but also because I'm not in the Pentagon. And I will tell you that every day out of the Pentagon is a great day. And so today is phenomenal. And those of you that serve on the Army staff will echo that all day long. Hey, I just wanted to be able to talk about a couple different things. And Bill mentioned it up front. General McQuistron, which he opened up this conference, talked about it as well. And that's the fact that you have a busy Army. And uh, General Fogg mentioned it as well. The bottom line is this is an Army that has over 180,000 soldiers in support of geographical combatant commands all over the world in over 140 countries. And that's not going to stop. We've been at war for 17 years. And I don't see an end coming anytime soon to our involvement in Southwest Asia. These are issues that we know that we've had to deal with for all this time. And then you add on the fact that the National Defense Strategy says that we have to be ready to be able to enter into great power competition and if we cannot deter great power conflict against a peer or neuro peer competitor, specifically Russia or China. These are the demands that have been placed on this army. And with those demands, the need for reform became paramount. It is seen by Congress in the last four National Defense Authorization Acts that they took this very seriously. You combine that with the explosion of technology that General Pegui talked about up front and how fast it's going and how we can't keep up with it in this lethargic, bureaucratic, process-based acquisition way of doing business. It is Cold War era way of doing business. Congress recognized that is our 535 stakeholders across the river. And they made a commitment in the last four NDAs to change that. And through tools such as other transaction authority, such as 804, which is middle tier acquisition, which allows us to be able to streamline through the requirements process and not have to worry about defining our requirements up front, but to be allowing us to experiment up front, determine what our requirements are, and then follow up. That's a huge tool. In addition, not having to follow the rules lockstep with DOD 5000, another huge tool with respect to middle tier acquisition, Section 804. Those tools, along with delegation, the mandate to delegate the programs from OSD down to the services, has been huge because it cut out a bureaucratic layer. OSD has stood up to the plate. Honorable Lord has been a great partner. She has delegated all but two programs to the Army, so now we own it. So careful what you ask for, right? We own it now. And those two other programs will be delegated shortly, we have no doubt, because she sees that we have the right path and the right strategy going forward. So OSD has acted, Congress has acted. What has the Army done? Well, we've done the same thing. We've decided, look, we've got to delegate those authorities from Dr. Jetty down to the program executive offices and down to the PMs, the program managers. Delegate the authority, hold people accountable and responsible. We streamlined the documentation. We created these things called cross-functional teams because a way of doing business of, of taking two to five years to get a requirement through the process was not the way that we needed to go as we go forward. Through a cross-functional team with all the right players, logisticians, program managers, budgeteers, engineers, industry, contracting officers, we can get at and testers. We can get at requirements that make sense and are not going after this thing called unobtainium, which we went after way too many times in the past, and it got us in trouble. Finally, the stand-up of Futures Command. So why the heck did we do it? Right now, if you take a look at where the Army was a year ago, before Futures Command stood up in July and reached its initial operational capability, we had a four-star commander that was in charge of readiness to make it sure that units could go fight tonight, that they were ready to go if called upon. That was the Force Comm commander's main driv drive. That was his job. That was his mission. Okay? That was where General Garrett earned his pay. We had a four-star command 
that was in charge of ensuring that the institutional training, that our recruitment, that our retention was taken care of. So we had an army that could go fight and win and had the discipline and the tools necessary to do that. That was a TRADOC commander, okay, General Townsend. We had a four-star commander who was in charge of sustainment, ensuring that the Army could sustain the things that we bought and ensure that, we, that they were ready to fight when called upon. When it came to modernization, we didn't have anybody in charge. It was everybody's additional duty. General Perna had an additional duty to run the research and development, the science and technology, while he was trying to sustain the force. General Townsend had a responsibility to do the requirements piece while he was trying to do all the institutional training and all the other things necessary in order to field an army. He didn't have anybody in charge. And the chief and the secretary were doing other things that were very important to the army in terms of readiness, because that has been and can remains our number one priority. So it became time to put a four-star in charge of this, to put a four-star in charge of the modernization of the Army, and a commitment with that four-star command, not a second of duty, not an additional task, but his sole purpose. So we built two pillars. The first pillar, futures and concepts. The ability to determine what that fight in 2028 looks like, or in 2035. What is going to be the unit of action to fight and win in a multi-domain battlefield? What is going to be the unit of action necessary to fight and win in a megacity? Is that a brigade combat team like we're organized today, or is it a completely different construct? What are the tactics, techniques, and procedures that are we going to need to have in order to fight and win in those fights, in those multi-domain operation battlefields? Finally, what is going to be the impact of, of s and in terms of artificial intelligence, hypersonic weapon systems, direct energy weapons, robotics, quantum computing. What will all that bring to the fight, and how do we best use it as tools? That's futures and concepts. That's Eric Wesley. That's his main thing, is to figure that out. Add to it General Wins with the Combat Capabilities Development Command. His job, bringing all the Arctics together, all the science and technology, ARL, and being able to experiment with concepts and with tools and capabilities and technology so that we can better inform our requirements so that when it goes to the acquisition side, the combat system side, that we're so much better prepared not to fail. And if we fail, we fail cheap. That's Futures Command in a nutshell. I'm glad to be here. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. General Ganey. Good afternoon. So truth in lending, uh, when you all change jobs or retire, retire, as I have done, you need to update your database here at AUSA. <laughs> so it was showing I was with Cyprus International. I am not. I left that wonderful organization and chose to retire, retire. But we do have Jan Edmonds in the audience who is representing Cyprus International. Uh, but I want to talk to you from the perspective of my experience and what I remember and where I think we need to go. So, you know, the challenge of delivery in a future contested battle space, I think the biggest thing we need to worry about is attacks on our logistic systems. Not just attacks to have denial of service, but attacks to spoof inaccurate data into our systems. And that is even scarier to me than just denial of service. So we need to be looking at what is it we need to do to, one, harden our systems. We're all worried about cyber, both commercial industry and the military. But what are we doing to look at how do we know we've been spoofed? How are we getting the data and cross-checking what we are getting to say, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right. I know historically, given this amount of time, given this amount of you know, battle, I should be seeing these demands, and I'm not seeing them. And then what, how do we then go back and look at that to say, OK, what do I need to be doing to altering? That gets into the second part of maybe we need to be looking at we have created a pull system on demand to give the right stuff at the right time at the right place. But should we have to create 
push packages, how would we do that? In the second area on how do we improve our distribution systems to again get the stuff forward at the right place at the right time, we need to be looking at how to do that the most efficient and effective way. So after having, uh, when I was traveling in the military, having my bags lost several times, I learned how to pack for a two-week trip with multiple uniforms, multiple social requirements into a carry-on and a backpack. That was a painful process, believe me. But that's what we need to do. How do you make it interoperable? How do you make it smaller packaging and more effective nesting everything such that you can get maximum use out of your capabilities so that when you're going forward, you make every asset count? That's all. <laughs> Thank you, General Ganey. Now I know why you were the DCG of Transcom after that. <laughs> well, with that, Mr. Bozeman. All right. Well, thank you. Um, which one doesn't fit up here? All of my distinguished uh, <laughs> colleagues up here with, uh, with, with uh, fantastic uh, backgrounds. Um, I'm going to talk to you probably with a little different voice, and it's a voice of industry, uh, obviously representing uh, Amazon. Um, I'll start, though, with a, a, a quote, and I certainly look forward to your, your questions. Uh, simply it says, um, what keeps me up at night is ensuring we have the right commodities at the right time, at the right place to execute the fight. That was on uh, 14 May 2019. It was a press correspondence, and it was from Lieutenant General Pegui. Um, that particular uh, quote is something that we do in Amazon billions of times a year, and it has to be done flawlessly. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is because we are living that. But I also say uh, the Department of Defense has a background and a, a foundation that really industry uh, was really born out of and simply has improved. For example, if you think about it, uh, training and aptitude, standard work, precision, execution, adaptability, and leadership. These are things that are commonplace, uh, not only in the industries I've been in and I've been with uh, I think three great companies in Harley Davidson, Caterpillar, and now uh, Amazon. Uh, very, very similar uh, words, but these are words that if industry walked out of the room, I'm sure exist in the vocabulary of the Department of Defense. Uh, and I would, I would beckon to say that um, advancing on those principles is probably the opportunity that the Department of Defense has and which you know, is why we're having these conversations that we're having up here. Um, I'm honored to be up here uh, on this panel. I'm looking forward to talking to you, one, about um, speed, precision, execution, but also about um, what we call the secret sauce of Amazon. I can't give you the total secret sauce, Jeff, <laughs> Jeff will probably. I think Seattle would call me here in a second. But I can say this. If we run out of anything in this room, I can get it to you in a couple hours. So don't, don't, don't worry about that. Yeah, that if you're a prime member, don't worry. That's, that's, someone did say that. Uh, hey, you keeping up with those things. That's good. Um, and then someone mentioned 30 to 40 days, and I was looking for the nearest AED uh, on here. So, no, but, but uh, it, it is about speed, and it's something that uh, we pride ourselves uh, on, on doing. Why do we do that? Uh, I love the technology conversation that's happening. Uh, I handle and my, my group handles really the middle mile um, transportation for Amazon globally. And what is the middle mile? It's really um, taking product from its inception when you order that product and it's put into a package uh, and then moving that through our vast system of assets and getting it to our final, as you would say, deployment or first mile delivery. And I do that through a host of sortation centers around the world. Um, all of our line haul or surface uh, transportation uh, globally, that is our, our network of, of trucking, uh, as, and also Amazon Air, all of our airplanes that we are building out uh, globally uh, here. Uh, that all falls under global transportation services, which I'm, I'm honored to head up. 
But we do that in the background with a lot of what we call ML, um, AI, and OR, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, and operations research, which are the things that you guys are talking about now. Or as I like to say, when you hit that button, that's when the magic happens, uh, and that is some of the secret sauce. But um, I look forward to talking about uh, some of that. Uh, and the last thing I tell you is at Amazon, we look forward to, uh, to failing. I know that sounds uh, a bit strange, but um, failing fast, reinventing, um, taking failure as a gift, taking that gift and actually uh, uh, reinventing things and making them better, but making them better fast. One of the things that made me actually decide to move over to Amazon was a quote by Jeff in a conversation that said, um, uh, we're not failing big enough, All right? So if you're going to fail, you're going to fail big, uh, and you're going to actually take that and actually reinvent uh, for your customer. And you're going to hear me talk about that. It's about obsession uh, with the customer. And when you have that obsession with the customer, you literally have a mentality every day that says we don't have a horizon. And if you don't have a horizon at Amazon, it means that you can create and invent anything. And that is what uh, all Amazonians do. Uh, and we have over 600,000 globally uh, around the world that have to wake up every day. Uh, and I will tell you every day, no one says day two in Amazon is always day one. So look forward to the conversation. Great, great. Well, I'm, I'm going to start off with um, General Ostrowski. And, and Paul, you, you briefly talked about um, the impacts of the last four NDAAs. And I'm gonna let's. I would like to take that a step farther. Um, with the with the standing up of the Army Futures Command, um, w were there any uh, Title Ten authorities that had an impact between Army Futures Command and ASOF that the team needs to be aware of? Uh, any conflicts, sir? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take the question. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I will tell you that. There are certain statutes that are obviously in place that place the acquisition authorities within the civilian uh, role of the government. And that power flows down to the Secretary of Defense, to the ANS, through the service secretaries, down to the service acquisition executives. And that's Title X, it's law. And it's one of these things that we know that we had to take into account with respect to Futures Command and how we would lash the two together, nest them in order to get after what it is that we're trying to get after, and that is getting capability to soldiers quicker. The stand-up of the Futures Command has been has enabled us to be able to turn that requirements process around. I mentioned two to five years in a way we used to do business. Now it's three to eight months mm -hmm. in terms of requirement. So that piece is very important to us. You add to it the ability of us to experiment and the authorities that Congress gave us through the Middle Tier Acquisition Authority as well as OTAs to get non-traditionals involved in acquisition. 5,000 companies do business with the Department of Defense. There are 23 million companies in the United States. And not to do math in public, but that's 22,995,000 companies worth of product that we're missing out on because they won't do business hmm. with DOD because it's too hard. And so that particular authority, combined with the futures and concepts, combined with what we call the Combat Capabilities Development Directorate and Command, allowed us to be able to take concepts with experimentation faster, based on the Army's top eight priorities, mm -hmm. using the money there in order to be able to move forward with it a lot faster than what we have in the past. Doc, Dr. Jetty knows that General Murray depends on him to be able to do the last piece of it and the most important piece in General Murray's mind. General Murray's report card will be graded, not based on a great concept that gets turned into doctrine or based on a great experiment that brings a new technology. His report card is written based on whether or not he's being able to deliver capability to soldiers. And he needs the acquisition community to go along with him nested in order to make that happen. I uh, really appreciate that, um, Paul. And um, General Gandhi, um, question for you. When you look at this future fight and sustaining the future fight, um, from your foxhole, what challenge do you see us um, having the right capability to least meet? It's a different way of answering the question because I'm 
so asking the question so uh, but um, any insight on that uh, from my perspective you know I had a little bit of experience at transcom with what we were trying to do with our artificial intelligence and uh, I was excited to hear about where we're going in the Army. I was at sustainment week and listening to General Fogg and then, you know, listening to industry. But I think we can, in the military, and in, in particularly the Army, we can do more with the artificial intelligence. And I don't think we've done enough to leverage that and using the big data. We're, st we're collecting. We're great collectors. But what we're not doing is taking that data and making it into operational information to use to figure that out. Uh, and, and that's where I think we need to really start going back and looking. Uh, the second thing I think we need to do is do some modeling to know what is our demands in the current fight and in past fights and project that out into future fights such that we can then crosswalk that against existing operational information to say, oh, this isn't working. Something is askew, to, again, to get to the spoofing. How do we know we're being spoofed? If you haven't collected data and analyzed it, then when you're trying to figure out what should I be seeing, what should the demands in the system be, and I'm not looking at that, to then start crosswalking and checking to go, I need to go back and check. I might be being spoofed because mm -hmm. I don't think we're doing that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, Bill, um, you know, from the seat you sit in, what can we learn from organizations such as Amazon and, and other organizations similar to how the DOD operates? Sir, thank you. Um, in a word, a lot. <laughs> but uh, at least failure being a gift, sir. Uh, you know, can I can I use some of that? Uh, but uh, but no, it's um, especially when it comes to big data and what General Ganey just mentioned about uh, being able to better predict. We have a long way to go. Uh, we, we're on this journey uh, building an Army leader dashboard for the. Chief, and uh, as we started digging into that about a year and a half ago or so, we looked at the Army's authoritative data sources. And the Army has over 1,300 authoritative data sources. And we're like, we better get our arms around that. And, uh, and we started doing that. We stood up something called an Army Analytics Board. And, uh, and then we established uh, stewards for certain types of data. And I ended up uh, with the short straw on uh, Army logistics data, so I'm the Army's logistics data steward. And uh, at first I thought that was a pretty nice title, but it's a, it's a monumental task. We have 216 authoritative data sources in Army logistics right now. And uh, well, I say we had. I've already killed 47 of those uh, as delegated from the boss as we try to clean up our data set. And, uh, and now as I look at what's left, I'd like to get us down to uh, really a set of authoritative sources that I could count on one or two hands. And uh, like I said, we've got a long way to go there. We have multiple authoritative sources for the same types of data, if you can believe that. And as we had, as some of the companies working on the Army Leader Dashboard, so they get a question and if they look at this data source, they get one answer. They look at that data source, they get a different answer. And there's lag times. I've learned there's this... Uh, there's this tension between quality of data and, and, and the, uh, the latency of data. We can make the data pretty clean, but it takes a long time, and then it becomes irrelevant. So, uh, so it's been, and I, and I just know in my gut that industry has cracked the code on this. And, uh, and back to things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, so much of our data is hand jammed in. And uh, with that comes a lot of high error rates. And uh, so we're trying to figure out how do, we, uh, how do we fix that. Data needs to be cleaned at the source of input, in my humble opinion, not on the back end, which is where we were kind of going. Hey, we'll just get the data into a bucket, and then we'll figure out what's good and what's bad. And you just can't do it that way. Time doesn't allow you to do it that way. So we're trying to figure out how to do that. No different than, you know, if I try to buy something off Amazon and I plug in the wrong credit card number, it tells me right then and there that I've screwed up and I've got to fix that or I can't buy that item or track it. 
And, uh, and that's where we need to be, you know, uh, and preferably right off our iPhone, as General Pagui mentioned this morning. So we have a lot to learn. We're, we, are, we are getting there. Uh, it is paramount that we get there in order to make this Army leader dashboard work correctly. We are even re-engineering organizations. And uh, I actually got a, a question from the audience that fits right in here, sir, if I could. It said, please share any insights regarding the use of analytics and the evolving role of what's now called LDAC. If you remember the old logistics support activity is now the logistics data and analytics center or analysis center, LDAC, uh, down in Huntsville. We had a logistics innovation agency up uh, co-located between uh, Fort Belvoir and New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. It is now the Logistics Enterprise Support Act Agency working uh, as a field operating agency for General Pagui. But, uh, but both of these organizations have been re-engineered to get after data. LDAC will really be the Army's logistics data manager, which is something they were doing in the past. But as we've gone to ERPs, that's sort of muddied the water a bit. But we do expect them to manage the Army's logistics data and to ensure the data quality is, uh, is right. And, and so we, we have to figure out how to use better tools like machine learning and AI to, uh, to clean up our data set. And that can get us into, well, uh, at least better forecasting. And we are, uh, we are not good at, at our demand forecasting and, uh, and really get us to predictive analytics. Right now, we, we really predict the future looking uh, in the past. And we do our demand forecasting based on historical consumption. And, uh, and that has really caught us in a bind. Uh, several sessions with the chief where he's like, how long is it going to take the supply chain to catch up with this increased op tempo? I mean, we were up at two, two to 300 uh, percent operating tempo against what we were doing five, six years ago, as you heard uh, General Ryan this morning on how many units, as an example, are deploying in the course of a year. And that is just uh, that is a real challenge when you're trying to have the parts available so as you increase the training and operations, you increase consumption of parts. And if you were you know, forecasting based on some lower rate, then you're kind of caught hanging. And that's how you get these long delay times that we've been wrestling with. So it's been a, been a real challenge. But I do, uh, I think we are getting after it. General Pagui will fire me if I don't make better progress at it soon. But, uh, but we, we are getting after it. Th thanks, Bill. Uh, along those li lines, um, Mr. Bozeman, um, when you when we reflect on what Amazon has, has accomplished over the last several years, it's absolutely amazing of the success. And oh, by the way, my wife has personally contributed <laughs> to your success. <laughs> I think we get a package every other day from Amazon. And it, go, it goes, feel bad about <laughs> it. It, it kind of ties into Bill's comment. How has Amazon, Amazon been able to keep pace and the progress of the supply chain to allow you to move at such lightning speed? Yeah, Larry, that's a, that's a great question. I do, I do want to clarify something. We say failure is a gift. It, it is. Repeated failure? <laughs> you're right. Now, that's waste, right? So, um, but what you're talking about is scale, and it is the thing that um, we breathe every day in Amazon. But behind that, you can just say scale, but there's a lot behind that um, to, to accomplish that. Uh, mainly around leadership and our, and our leadership principles that we live by within the company. And I won't go through all of them. It's 14 leadership principles. You won't see them plastered on walls or anything because they're ingrained into the DNA of the company. It's how we interview. It's how we lead. It's how we make decisions. Uh, and why would I bring that up? Uh, on, on scale, as you say. One of the leadership principles we have uh, that centers around, it's probably the, the center point and everything else is around it, is customer obsession. And, and you really have to learn this when you come to Amazon, just when we say customer obsession, it really is the word obsession. Um, and, and I've worked, again, in great organizations, and I'd say those were customer-focused organizations. I say that because in Harley I was riding handlebar to handlebar with customers. That's pretty focused. And, and, in, and in Caterpillar, I'm, I'm in the dirt and somewhere in the middle of the world uh, with the customer. But in Amazon, it, it is an obsession. So going from focus to obsession, you will really start with what that customer wants and, goes, and go backwards. And so we do that with scale. And one of the leadership principles we have um, is the ability to look around corners 
Uh, and, and, and when we say look around corners, we're really looking for individuals that have that ability um, to, to predict and also to think big. Uh, that's important for you to keep up. The e-commerce uh, growth is 30% that's happening every year. Now you can stop and you can say with Amazon scale and where it is, boy, it's pretty large and everything. We, we, I don't think that way and I don't think my colleagues think that way. We look at it and say the global retail market, uh, Amazon represents about 1% of global retail. Still a lot of grass to cut, right, up under that. <laughs> Now, if you get into e-commerce and you get it into certain geos within the U.S., of course, we're much higher than that on the e-commerce space. But, but we're competing against really retail overall, and that's what, what Amazon does. And there's a lot uh, to gather when you do that. And so you have to start thinking about um, artificial intelligence, and a lot of it is machine learning. Uh, and I talked to a few individuals in this room uh, really about that. Uh, and, and I was actually out doing a presentation a, a couple of months ago, and we got into this conversation on how that can actually go into the Department of Defense. And there are several things that um, there are technologies that we do that I think are very relevant. If you, how many of you have, have heard about Amazon Go, the stores? All right, that's good. Um, and those of you who haven't, it's really a technology, it's physical stores. We have them now. In, in, in certain major cities. There's about 12 stores that are live now, but I saw the beta testing on that as we were doing it. And that is a technology in which you walk into the store, um, you grab what you want. You First of all, you take a barcode on your phone because everyone in here is a Prime member. I won't ask if you're not, I'm sure you are. <laughs> and and, and you, you go into the store, it lets you in. Um, you take a bag or whatever you like, you take anything you want in that store, and you walk out. You don't have to interact with anyone. And about two minutes later, you'll get something on your phone tell you exactly what you purchased uh, and exactly what we transacted. So why is that important? I, we, we were talking, and I'm saying, now, being from the south side of Chicago and growing up, it's always a little bit strange when I walk into a store and I'm just kind of <laughs> grabbing things. So, but uh, I'm just, you know, just saying. So, That's how it's done in Chicago. <laughs> just got to get used to that, you know. But if you think about what the Department of Defense is doing, everything you transact, uh, imagine if you take a technology like that, uh, and all of the people you have managing um, things, and I always called it um, uh, eliminating hidden factories. And there are a lot of hidden factories in the industry. There are a lot of hidden factories in the Department of Defense. And Dave, what's a hidden factory? A hidden factory is something where you're doing something over again. It is waste. Uh, and that's, that's everything from back office, writing a memo to correct a memo, right? Or going in and having someone uh, actually, as we were talking out here, opening up a box that you bought from someone just to count and make sure everything is in that box. That's probably a lot of waste that goes on every day in the Army and the entire Department of Defense uh, where you can have systems in place uh, that really allow you to flow product and flow it fast and let it know where it, where it needs to be. And I, it, this is a long answer so I can just get to the point. I just said something and my, one of my teams are really upset with me because we were just on stage last week with our worldwide leadership meeting, and they said, um, Mr. Bozeman, are the, you, you once said that Amazon Air is a defect, and do you still believe that? And I said, absolutely, I believe that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to add some other things to it. Anything that comes into the way of once we put that product in a box and where it needs to go to its customer, any stop along the way is a defect. And so our mentality has to be one that says the straightest line to the customer is really where you want to be. Now, will you ever achieve that? Maybe not, but you have to have a mentality that says, if I have to fly a product from one coast to the next, I'm going to do that because now, as someone said two day, it's no longer two days, one day, right? So we're going to get you that product in one day, but we're going to do that through the modes that we have available until such time as we have a cheaper, even faster mode to do that. And I think that's a, a mentality that you can have within a Department of Defense, but it's also one that we have to deal with the scale that you're talking about, Larry. We're constantly looking around the corner to say what's going to be and put in the process and the systems ahead of time to make sure we can deal with that. Um, thanks, um, Dave. 
it's, it's obvious that um, Amazon has taken advantage of technologies to, to get to the point where it is. So Rodney, I'm going to ask you this question, um, and I will tell you, when I served as the CASCOM command, I'd probably give myself a C minus in, in the area of technology integration. Um, how is CASCOM approaching technology integration to be able to complement where the Army is trying to go with moving with, this, with the type of speed that it, tends, it anticipates? Yes, sir. So, uh, you know, in the area of our logistics information systems, uh, and I'll just concentrate, there's plenty of other places we could go with that question, but I, I really like what I just heard about maybe having the mentality of if we're trying to get a required uh, uh, repair part uh, to uh, fix a tank, uh, how many, you know, defects do we go through before it gets there? Uh, and there's quite a few things that we could improve upon and uh, just as already been mentioned we do a pretty good job of collecting a lot of data but how useful is the data and are we doing the right things with that information are we turning data into relevant knowledge so that we can make the right decisions and so we're not good at that at all and that's where we need to learn from industry and so uh, ultimately, what we want to be able to do is to see ourselves better, and we talked about the precision logistics uh, that we need to have on the battlefield. Um, how can we use the tools that we have now? Uh, we have GCSS Army, we have LMP, I'm throwing a bunch of acronyms out there. We just have information systems that are tools to get us to a combat capability, and we can never forget that that's why we built the tool. And so it's a little bit different than industry, but at the same time, there's a lot of things that we can improve upon so that we can anticipate a requirement, uh, understand when there's a shortfall, and almost uh, before that failure occurs, prevent it. And we could do that. Technology is available now, sensor technology, uh, cyber protected uh, information systems, those technologies are out there, but we don't use it. Even when we bring in an ERP we, or, or a logistics information system uh, and we field it, we don't get it to the point where it's intuitive, as was discussed this morning with, hey, mm -hmm. you could use your phone. It updates automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, if, as an example, GCSS Army was intuitive and had the right user experience, then we'd have better data because on the input, it's not easy to use that system. And so I could go on there, but th we're definitely in all of these spaces uh, to, try, to try to improve the tools that we have. Yeah, one of, one of the big concerns in employing all these tools is the cyber security aspect. So, so Mr. Bozeman, I'm gonna come back to you. What has Amazon done in the era of cybersecurity to you know, address concerns? And then I'd like to open it up to the panel uh, for additional remarks. Yeah, I think, first of all, I mean, you could sit here and talk about that all day. Um, part of what we have to do with the scale that we're on is one, make sure we have um, proper partners uh, in, in driving the technology. And in this case, it has to be within the family. I mean, if you think about AWS, anyone who's heard of AWS as Amazon Web Services? Yeah, so that's, you know, driving um, cloud-based technologies, uh, security technologies within Amazon is, uh, is important. You imagine uh, the amount of contacts uh, that we have of uh, not only customer data that is sensitive, but also the amount of intrusions and attacks that uh, obviously would come on uh, to your system. Uh, and, and I just think they've built uh, really solid uh, type of old term firewalls to, to be put in to, to really uh, secure that data. Even myself uh, on the road and what we do for authenticity, uh, I have to get into the system. We, you know, the technology that we have now has just changed uh, even in the last few months that I have just to log into my laptop. It's, and it's the UI or the user, the user interface is really in, uh, easy for me. But just doing a tap of the finger on a particular um, something on the side of my laptop, that ensures the authenticity and the, the factor authentication that I can get into the system that I'm not compromised on here. So the company is always thinking about uh, cybersecurity uh, and protecting not only our systems but our customers 
uh, data as well. It's vital. Thank, thanks, um, Dave. Um, Paul, back, back to you. Um, as we look at um, employing our future sustainment um, strategy, is there, how do you see in your position sustainment fitting into the acquisition process? That's a great question, sir. I would, I would say this, that, you know, if you take a look at the way we've done business in terms of source selections and the rest of it, as we go through a best value competition with industry, and we always normally, unless it's the lowest price, technically acceptable type of strategy, and instead it's best value, we look at technical up front. Okay, that is the most highly weighted factors, technical. And with a technical, it has all of the things such as the systems engineering, whether or not the capability is what it is that we want, and the weapon can shoot as far as we need it to go, and all the rest of it, whether it's capable. And then we say the next more, most important is maybe past performance or cost. And if cost is not the second thing, then it's the third, and past performance, you can flip those. So there's evaluations that we go through on each and every one of our programs in a best value competitive environment. What's not in the technical, though, and what needs to be in the technical is the whole piece of sustainment. It's not there typically. That's OK in the past, where we had fobs and cops to hang out on in a coin fight. But if you think for a second that in a multi-domain, peer-on-peer, high-intensity conflict that we're going to have FSRs running around the battlefield, we're kidding ourselves. So what we need to be putting in our solicitations and telling industry is that if you can't deliver in an intuitive, used by soldiers, repaired by soldiers, maintained by soldiers' capability, then you are not competitive. Quick disconnects on 90% of a mechanical device so I can pull it in the field in the middle of the heat of a battle. How important is that to a soldier? Oh, by the way, with gloves on, all right, in freezing temperatures. If we're not going to start getting serious about putting those things into the requirements, then we are going to continue to fail when it comes to being able to maintain this equipment in the heat of the fight. And so we are now in the process of getting that piece together. Tougher to do on commercial, tougher to do on NDI type stuff, but if we're telling industry up front that it's got to be maintained intuitively by soldiers on the battlefield, they will develop systems that allow us to do that. Sir, can I, can sure. I answer a question? Absolutely. So uh, it links to um, what was just discussed, and I had a question that says, how is CASCOM uh, influencing sustainment requirements in the Army's top six uh, priority programs and developing you know, things in coordination with POs and C uh, CFTs uh, uh, linked to reliability, maintainability, et cetera? So uh, just to uh, answer that, as the Army reorganized uh, towards an uh, Army Futures Command within uh, TRADOC organizations, the, the centers of excellence, uh, our capabilities uh, directorates, uh, portions of those organizations re-patched uh, to AFC. And so, and they work in the same building. They didn't move to Austin, they didn't move anywhere. They just work there. Uh, within the organization, and there's an 06 for, uh, for us, there's an 06-led uh, staff that gets after this integration, uh, to use an old term, but one that I think everybody will understand. Before we get to milestone C, how do we work things to the left and make sure that logistics is included, the concept of support linked to the, the way the concept of the operation for that piece of equipment will be executed, requirement, requirements for reliability, uh, reduce fuel consumption, those types of things, making sure that the weight of whatever we're building can be transported on a trailer, uh, you know, et cetera. So some mistakes that really we've made in the past, now uh, this organization's being able to get after that. Bill, you got a couple of questions? Yeah. Um, from the audience. Here's one. Um, from a talent management perspective, how are we preparing for the expanded Battle space and multi and sustainment in multi domain operations. Uh, one of, one of my jobs is being the functional chief of the of the three uh, civilian logistician career programs: supply, maintenance, and transportation, which adds up to about fifty five thousand of the Army's two hundred twenty thousand or so civilians, both GS white collar and wage grade or blue collar. 
and uh, and you know we uh, we have a long way to go in getting our talent to where it needs to be with the skill sets we need for the future. For one, uh, our ERPs between GCSS Army, LMP, GFEVs has given us big data. Some of it arguably isn't at the quality we need it to be, but we're getting there on the big data. And now we're at the point of now that we've got big data, what do we do with it? You, you know, and uh, what what I think we need in the Army are experienced logisticians that know how to leverage big data to achieve better outcomes. And better outcomes, I mean higher readiness at lower cost. We achieve our readiness goals generally, but we do it at, at a uh, almost unconstrained cost. We have to achieve the readiness goals and we pay what we gotta pay to get there. And, uh, and I think we can do a whole lot better than that. Um, a, as the functional chief have stood up a, a, uh, a credentialing uh, path to create master logisticians in the uh, for the white collar side of our of our logistics civilian workforce, um, it consists of both experiential and some academic uh, courses that they have to take in order to achieve and do some testing, uh, working to get that nationally recognized. And it may even have applications beyond the Army, but I do believe we need to sort of set the bar and get the bar higher. And like I said, and get to where we can leverage big data to achieve these outcomes. We also need, and what we don't really have, and part of that re-engineering I mentioned uh, in trying to create, take our LIA to this LESA, this Logistics Enterprise Support Agency, we are hiring data architects, data scientists, and ORSAs that can come in and team up in sort of a cross-functional team type approach with experienced logisticians so we, so we can sort of fast forward that. But we, we, are, we are, I think, making great progress. I think we're doing the same thing on the green suit side. We worked very hard uh, at CASCOM back when General Weish and I were there. And, uh, and I know General Fogg and his team is carrying it on with how we evolve both our AIT training as well as, as our professional military education between Bolick and CAPS Career Course. Uh, and what and how we train th those soldiers to use the same ERPs uh, to leverage the same big data data to achieve the outcomes for the missions within their units. So, uh, so we're making good progress there. Got a long way to go. Uh, thanks. Uh, any, any more comments on talent management? Well, it's, I, I mean, I, I love talent management, Larry. Is what we um, is what we count on as a as an organization uh, within Amazon. Uh, again, not only you have to look around the corner, even on talent uh, as well. So you know, we, we look at the pipeline of talent coming in and the progression uh, all, the way, all the way through that pipeline on what it is we would ultimately uh, need. Tech is obviously uh, big in Amazon, but uh, there are a number of different uh, talent pipelines that we have. Uh, it's interesting. We. Um, uh, a lot of people say, hey, you're, you're, you're bringing in robotics, you're doing all this, you're going to replace people. Uh, and in fact, uh, with the amount of robotics that we've introduced into Amazon, and we have introduced a lot, we've actually hired uh, more Amazonians, you know, 300,000 more uh, Amazonians within the space. Uh, now, some of that is scale, but some of it is different work uh, as well uh, that comes up. So we have to have a wide vision uh, when it comes to talent and in, in an industry, you know, that's important for us as we're as we continue uh, our own uh, kind of battle. Thank, thank you. Now, there's one area we haven't talked about yeah. that um, is is definitely a critical enabler enabler as we move forward. That's the industrial base. Um, so, Rodney, I want to kind of start with you, and if you can share any thoughts on how you see that shaping up over the between now and 2028. And Paul, anything that you could add? Uh, I think the audience would really appreciate it. Yeah. So, yes, sir. So, um, you know, the the in, you know we talked in you know to go back to the FM40 for a second. Uh, the CONUS area, our uh, strategic support area, and how po important that is uh, with our enterprise partners, uh, AMC, uh, which has the organic industrial base. Uh, to think about the our our partner, you know, you heard General Ryan uh, talked about Transcom. They see industry as kind of uh, a component of uh, Transcom, that fourth component. Uh, it's absolutely required uh, for us to be able, and it really links to back to that 
uh, big data and the useful, uh, relevant information, um, how do we have an industry base that can support the requirements on the battlefield uh, quickly? And so that uh, setting the theater, we think about uh, a forward theater, whether it's in Europe or it's in uh, the Pacific, but we have to think about setting uh, uh, our operations within CONUS, within that strategic support area uh, as well. How do we work with the industry as a partner to make sure that, that we can project our forces, that we execute uh, the things that we need to do for readiness at the right levels? And so uh, that is absolutely uh, kind of something that I know General Perna has taken it upon himself as a priority to set uh, the strategic support area up for uh, success in uh, projecting our forces. So I would just add that obviously we have both an organic and an inorganic uh, industry industrial base that we've got to be able to work with in order to ensure that we are not in a position where we're asking the inorganic to do things that was discussed earlier in the session, not this one, but the one before it. We got to send a signal to industry. Okay. It can't be a billion widgets today and next year we buy zero. That's just not going to cut it with respect to how they operate. And so we have to be able to figure out how we're going to ensure that we take into account the responsible amount of production that industry can provide. In addition, we ought to think about potentially ensuring that industry has visibility into our supply and our supply databases so that they, if they would like to, at their own risk, invest in those high, I would say, demand items that we, they know we're going to need, but they may not have an order signal yet by the Army. So they see the stockage of helicopter transmissions dwindling, but yet there's not a demand signal being sent by the Army. But if they have visibility into our databases and they can see that, then they can, at their own risk, if they like, knowing that it is a high demand item, begin the long lead process of getting the parts so that when that demand signal eventually comes, and it will, they'll be ready to respond. So we have to think about whether we're willing to open up those databases to our, our inorganic partners. On the organic side of the house, we built huge capability in the surge, and it is a precious capability. And we got to maintain that capability because you never can tell when the next fight is going to come. But at the same time, it needs to be right-sized, and it needs to ensure that it's sustainable. So those are the challenges that General Perna fights every day, is maintaining both of those industrial bases. Yeah, a lot of great discussion. Um, but one of the things we have not covered is that we're not going to be in this fight by ourselves. It's, we're going to be with our, our allies and other partners around the globe. And so for the panel, um, any thoughts on that? And I know, General Ganey, I gave you the card, but um, any, any thoughts on how we can best team up with these, these partners that we're going to be actually in the fight with? Sure. From uh, the perspective of our fellow joint partners, let's just talk about the other services. Uh, we'll start with that as a part one component. We in the Army have the responsibility of common user land transportation. And that's a huge component of demand that comes to the Army. Um, we already know that we have a shortage of truck assets to both move units on the battlefield, but also then to do the, with those same limited assets, the resupply missions. Factor on top of that the requirement to support other services with land transportation and, as we heard earlier, DLA, because we cannot assume that the great DLA support that we had before on the battlefield delivering food, fuel, and other supplies directly to our forward support activities, that we will have that again. So part of the re things that we need to do in the Army is make sure that we're both doing modeling of what has been historical demand requirement, but also working with our fellow services to ensure that both it's articulated in the palm, but that comes with this, you know, a, uh, an edge to it because if a service defines another service requirement, that's money that gets diverted out of their budget, and no one wants to do that. But you need to then start looking, are we articulating that in the war plans? 
and then looking at what data we have and questioning other services when they have not articulated that accurately. Now let's move to partners. You all know that when we were forward, we had to help support, of course, other agencies that were forward on the battlefield, either with billeting, with food support in the dining facilities, the mess halls, and all of the other logistic support to their locations that they were forward. As well, we had requirements when I was in multinational force Iraq to support other nations that all of a sudden came to the fight but without the equipment. And again, the burden was placed on the Army to help resource them with the equipment and supplies and billeting capability for those other nations. So is there a factor that we need to put in in our modeling to start putting those demands into the system as placeholders? Because that and then at Transcom, we started putting placeholders in for lift requirements because nobody was forecasting that at the COCOM level. I, I can just add that, it, you know, the whole foreign military sales aspect is a tremendous win-win. It builds partnerships and it, it enables us to keep our industrial base warm, uh, but it comes with an obligation to sustain those that, that equipment. And uh, remember when I talked about that, that when, when the op tempo was way up here and, and our demand forecasting was down here, we went through a little hole there in our swing on, uh, on having the right parts and it was a delicate balance keeping our, our strategic partners sustained as well as getting our readiness up to where it needed to be. But, but we got through it through, uh, through great partnerships and, um, and it is an invaluable uh, part of our way ahead. Uh, just one last point. You know, I grew up where the doctrine said host nation support was really a place you got support from. Uh, the reality, I think, is most of us have lived through the last 17 years, host nation support is where you provide support to host nations. And, uh, and it is just a different frame of thought, and, uh, and it really affects what you end up having to bring into the battle space. Over. Well, I got to tell you, I, I, I feel much better now and as I think about standing on that hilltop in Poland. <laughs> And um, knowing that, um, that, that there's folks out there like individuals on this panel and out there in that audience that will ensure that we have and maintain that competitive edge on the battlefield. We're running right on time. And so um, subject to any of the questions, thank you for your time. Godspeed. <laughs>